Today's news and campaign report with Peter Sissons. A surprising new development tonight in the Cash for Questions affair. The BBC correspondent Martin Bell has the backing of Labour and the Liberal Democrats to be the anti-sleaze candidate against the Conservative Neil Hamilton. Security checks continue at Aintree, but the Grand National will take place tomorrow. And Leicester scramble a last gasp equaliser to earn a replay in the final of the Coca-Cola Cup. Good evening. The BBC correspondent Martin Bell is ready to be the surprise anti-sleaze candidate in the Tatton constituency of the former Conservative Minister Neil Hamilton. Mr Hamilton has been under a cloud over allegations that he took money in return for asking questions in Parliament, allegations which he hotly denies. Mr Hamilton has had support from his constituency association, though he's not yet been formally adopted as their candidate. Tonight it was revealed that Martin Bell has the backing of both the Labour and Liberal Democrat candidates in the Tatton seat, which he will contest if Mr Hamilton doesn't stand down. Here's our chief political correspondent, John Sargent. At Tatton Conservative Association headquarters in Knutsford tonight, there was no official reaction to the news that their beleaguered candidate would be facing a tough new opponent. Martin Bell is a distinguished BBC correspondent who won wide acclaim for his work in Bosnia. A highly experienced war reporter, he is famous for his coolness under fire, even when filmed after being hit by shrapnel. Okay. I'll survive. Martin Bell's celebrity status and his lack of party political associations appealed to both Labour and the Liberal Democrats. He'll stand aside as the anti-corruption candidate if Neil Hamilton resigns or if he fails to be readopted on Tuesday as the Conservative candidate for Tatton. Well, it really shouldn't be necessary to do this, but the reason why we and the Liberal Democrats have decided to back Martin Bell as the anti-corruption candidate in Tatton is because of Mr Major's failure to show leadership and to sort out the wrongdoing in his own party. It's obviously a last resort to have to have an independent anti-corruption candidate, uh, but the question now is for Mr Hamilton. Will he follow Mr. Tim Smith? Will he do the decent thing? Will he stand down? Mr. Hamilton is accused of taking cash for asking parliamentary questions, a charge he has consistently denied. His case was still being considered by the independent parliamentary commissioner when the election was called. The owner of Harrods, Mohammed El Fayed, has given evidence claiming that he personally paid cash to Mr. Hamilton to ask questions on his behalf. And tonight, one of the leading Tatton Conservatives renewed his call for Mr Hamilton to go. I think that he should um, withdraw his name as a candidate for um, the Conservative Party in Tatton for the good of the party and for um, the good of um, every other Conservative candidate standing in the country. The Prime Minister last week answered a string of questions about whether Mr Hamilton should stay on. He insisted that it was up to the local party and that Mr Hamilton should be treated as innocent unless proved guilty. This evening, a senior minister argued that sleaze was not a critical issue in the election. People know that sleaze is not the basis on which they're going to cast their votes. They will cast their votes on the basis of who is best for jobs, for living standards, for their taxes, and so on. And I think that is what will be uppermost in people's minds. The BBC issued a statement saying Martin Bell is entitled to exercise his democratic right to stand for Parliament. As soon as we were informed of his decision, he was told that his work would cease and he would be on unpaid leave for the duration of the campaign. We will review his position with the BBC once the election is over. He will not immediately return to normal news duties. At Martin Bell's house in London, there was no answer to callers. He let it be known that he was not giving interviews but he will appear at a news conference tomorrow. This is a serious blow to the Conservative leadership. If nothing else, it puts Slees back on the top of the agenda. Those loyal to Mr Hamilton face an agonising choice. Do they continue to back him, even if there's now a real risk that by doing so, they'll lose what's normally a very safe Conservative seat? John Sargent, BBC News, Westminster. The Prime Minister has accused Tony Blair of performing a U-turn over his policy on privatisation and said Labour's manifesto was falling apart. 
His attack followed Labour's confirmation that it'll look at selling off billions of pounds worth of government assets if it wins the general election. Our political correspondent David Walter reports. Damaged so often by divisions, the Tories staged a show of unity today. We're not here for an interview, we're here to speak inside. Though she wouldn't talk to the press, Lady Thatcher did speak to the mass ranks of Tory candidates, showing with John Major by her side that for the moment, all the Conservative big guns are pointing in the same direction. In his first full-length television interview of the campaign, the Prime Minister had Tony Blair firmly in his sights. The Labour leader was incompetent, he said. He slithered and squirmed to duck questions. And on trade union reform, Scotland, and now privatisation, Labour's position was changing daily. Their manifesto is falling apart before our eyes. Three days, a big change every day. A manifesto that's taken years to produce is taking days to fall to pieces. Labour deny that they've changed their line at all since their manifesto was published. But there does seem to be a new emphasis on policies which until recently were regarded as Tory territory. They've now confirmed a thoroughgoing review of public assets to see what might be sold off. I've always said since I became Shadow Chancellor uh, that we'll do what is in the public interest, that where resources are not being properly used in the public sector, we'll look at how they can be used better, and if necessary, uh, we will sell them off if they have no further use. Air traffic control is one area where Labour might go ahead with straightforward privatisation. They certainly weren't ruling it out today. What matters, they say, is what works. Tomorrow, in a speech in the city, Tony Blair will say, the presumption should be that economic activity is best left to the private sector, with market forces being encouraged to operate. The Liberal Democrats claim they've not been against privatisation in principle, although they have attacked the way it's been done. And they are against a wholesale sell-off of public assets. It's another astonishing uh, evidence of the Labour Party's determination to place themselves to the right, and indeed sometimes even to the right of the Conservatives. And I think for many people will find that extraordinary. Later this week, Labour will publish a special manifesto for business. They're also planning a party political broadcast, which will feature endorsements by business leaders. All this undoubtedly will lead the Tories to complain that their opponents are stealing their clothes, an accusation of which Labour have little fear, so long as their new policies prove popular. David Walter, BBC News, Westminster. The Grand National is to go ahead tomorrow, more than 48 hours after it was abandoned because of terrorist threats. Thousands of people who spent the night in temporary accommodation have been back to the course today to collect their vehicles and personal property. Our sports correspondent Kevin Geary reports from Aintree. It was the biggest security operation of its type ever mounted on these shores and unique in its complexity. Every inch of Aintree's vast acres had to be combed meticulously. Some 7,000 cars, vans and buses were individually inspected, their registrations recorded and checked, and they found nothing. Yet the threat had been so potent it could never be dismissed as a hoax. Besides, the course had to be swept clean for rerunning the ill-fated 150th Grand National tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Come! With the dedication of the officers, they are specially trained. We are going to put a ring of steel around this race course. Once my officers have been through it, I'll be able to guarantee with some certainty that this is safe. As the horses, due to have contested yesterday's showpiece, were being exercised amid the tranquility of nearby Haydock Racecourse this morning, the decision was being taken to go ahead with the race, despite everything that had happened. Uh, I think the message we're sending out is that uh, we wish to run this great race. It's part of our national heritage. Uh, it is one of the most important worldwide sporting events, and we intend to go ahead with it tomorrow. Independently came confirmation that all bets would be honoured or returned. Racing had decided it would not be intimidated. We can't not go on tomorrow. Otherwise, every sporting event, every big occasion will be threatened and it'll be stopped. And uh, we've got to show them that that isn't going to happen. Five hours we've been stuck here. Meanwhile, outside Aintree, those stranded since the bomb warnings yesterday were becoming increasingly frustrated at the delay in being allowed to return to their cars and buses. No, 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 that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. Finally, they were allowed to go, taking with them mixed reflections on hardships and misery experienced, but also, hearteningly, on the kindness of Liverpudlians. I am absolutely amazed at the generosity of the Liverpool people. We've been put up, myself and uh, my fiancée, Helen, have been put up by a couple, a uh, local couple, uh, who had contacted a hotel and said, 
if they uh, if they had anybody who was struggling for any rooms, please contact them. It was a story repeated all over Liverpool, a spontaneous gesture from a city that instantly recognises and responds to hardship. More than 2,000 people have been accommodated overnight in makeshift dormitories in schools and sports halls, and then fed this morning. A logistical nightmare overcome with commendable efficiency and born with fortitude. We were given the opportunity to go to people's houses to start with. We decided to stay at the leisure uh, centre with everybody else, and it was yeah, terrific camaraderie and atmosphere. Yeah. And the, the social services people were terrific. I haven't done any sleep, but it's yeah, you know, but yeah, you know, it's been it's been pretty good really. The local people, you know, looked after as well. Not too many though will be coming back tomorrow. A crowd of only 10,000 is expected. For those who do won't be able to drive. All vehicles will be banned. Everyone will be searched. <laughs> More than 30 hours after those two short phone calls, the chaos may be over, but the disruption continues. Everyone will try their best, of course, but there's no way they can hope to make tomorrow's national its usual vibrant self. Kevin Geary, BBC News, Aintree. And tomorrow you can see the race live here on BBC One. Coverage begins at 4 o'clock with the race starting at 5, and there'll be highlights later on BBC One at 7.30. There's been a furious response from the Labour Party to claims by the Home Secretary Michael Howard that Labour can't be trusted on terrorism. Labour have accused Mr Howard of deliberately breaking an agreement that no party should try to make electoral gains from terrorist incidents. From Belfast, Dennis Murray reports. Two phone calls by the IRA wrecked the Grand National, grabbed the world's attention and put Northern Ireland and the ability of Irish Republicans to interfere with ordinary life in England at the top of the election agenda. The Home Secretary seized on what he believes to be a contradiction in Labour's position on Sinn Féin's entry to talks and on the anti-terrorist laws to say the party couldn't be trusted on terrorism. The Northern Ireland Political Development Minister was asked if he agreed. Well, we know that they haven't supported us on the Prevention of Terrorism Act in the past. But the important thing is that we all make it absolutely clear at this time that terrorism is not going to pay, that the men of violence are not going to achieve their political ends by the sort of activity we saw yesterday, and the democracy will never be held to ransom. Labour was absolutely furious, accusing the government of breaking a pre-election agreement not to use terrorism for party political purposes. You have the government talking about trust. I don't think you can believe anything they say when you have ministers like Michael Howard trying to make party political capital out of IRA terror. It's nothing but a cheap smear. What the public wants is for politicians of all parties to stand shoulder to shoulder behind the guidelines issued by the Home Office against IRA terrorism whenever it occurs. Tonight, though, the Conservatives insisted that Mr. Howard had not broken the agreement, had not used a terrorist incident. What he'd done, they said, was to point out what he saw as two policy U-turns on Northern Ireland by his Labour shadow, Jack Straw. Labour is clearly very sensitive about this kind of criticism, and the whole row underlines the perception of all the parties that the British public is incensed by the IRA's actions. All the parties feel they must be seen to be tough on terrorism, but ultimately the new government will have to take a political decision about whether Sinn Féin does enter talks, and they all agree on that, not until there's a new and genuine IRA ceasefire. Dennis Murray, BBC News.